Oh, hello. I'm so glad you're here. The expedition is going to depart soon. Are you ready for Zendikar? <laughs> Make sure that you've packed everything you need for this adventure in your bag of holding. You're gonna need a utility knife, uh, some spare supplies, probably a map of the area. Uh, no, wait, this is the wrong plane entirely. Uh, ooh, no, this is really the, the wrong plane. Well, nonetheless, I hope that you've broken in those boots. No socks on this journey, because we are going to be blazing some trails. Zendikar is always an adventure, and you're never sure what you'll find. Today, let me take you through the five best commander cards you're likely to uncover this time around. There's some real gems, so let's get into it. Come on already. We know that Lithoform Engine's gonna be the number one pick. Let's go already. Uh-huh, great. So why'd you even bother signing up for the... You know what? I I'll, I'll catch up, I'll catch up. Uh, first, why don't we take a breather? I have a quick word about this video. This video is brought to you in part by Hecna, a new fifth edition adventure story that is truly a carnival of horrors. Designed to take characters through levels one through 10, Hecna is both a setting and a campaign guide with plenty of replayability. Game masters and players alike will delight in this whimsical, dark carnival setting. As I said, Hecna is a campaign setting for 5th edition. Inspired by horror settings of the 1980s, players will traverse the gruesome yet goofy carnival world of the Revelia. Hecna features a cast of scary characters and strange new sights, so you can create infinite adventures featuring their unique card mechanic-based system. So thank you to Hecna for sponsoring this video. If you're interested in picking up a copy of the Hecna PDF, physical book, or other awesome assets, check out the link in this video's description. I think you'll find Hecna to be a ghoulishly good time, though not as ghoulish as the reality that surrounds us all. All right, before we get started, yes, I acknowledge it wouldn't be a Magic the Gathering set if there wasn't one card that everybody is saying is overpowered and broken for Commander, so let's get that right out of the way. Zendikar Rising is no different. Lithoform Engine is that card. It's going to be our honorable mention, though, because I have more interesting things to talk about. Lithoform Engine is essentially a Rings of Bright Hearth and Strionic Resonator rolled into one. It's a repeatable twin cast, and it also does something nothing else has aspired to before. It copies a permanent spell, with the copy resolving as a token. So yeah, I can see why everyone's excited about this. You could sneeze and this thing would combo. And we could sit here and really dig into the myriad ways which you could break it wide open. The thing is, though, it's probably one of the least interesting cards previewed on many levels. You heard me. Sure, it's good, but it's pretty generic. And before you get carried away decrying the end times it will bring and getting flashbacks to Paradox Engine's Prime, just realize that you're probably going to see this across the table from you in a combo-oriented build pretty rarely. I have no doubt it'll be expensive to get hold of and probably one of the chase cards in the set. If it's not played in combo-oriented decks already running the likes of Strionic Resonator to win, it'll probably just be jammed into casual decks as a value piece. The sky isn't falling by any means. In fact, the sky isn't falling. It's rising! The Skyclaves are reforming. We'd best get this party on the road before all the good loot is taken. Coming in at number five is Feed the Swarm. It's not going to be a successful expedition if you don't pack something to eat, but if you didn't pack trail mix, I'd ask you kindly refrain from ingesting the rest of the party. It's bad for business. Feed the Swarm costs one and a black. At sorcery speed, you can destroy target creature or enchantment, and you lose life equal to that permanence converted mana cost. Yup, that's enchantment removal in black. Straight up. None of this mire and misery or Farika's libation sacrifice stipulation or giving the opponent a choice. You can now destroy an enchantment in black. 
that's pretty huge for, well, I'm gonna be honest, it was huge for Popper, it's, it's huge for everything, but it's especially huge for Commander. And I'm sure many Black and Rakdos players have breathed a collective sigh of relief at the prospect of having a no-nonsense cheap answer to Commander's new big bad enchantment, Oubliette. That's right, Oubliette, to run alongside the more inefficient answers like Meteor Golem or Spine of Ishsa. I can see this being a slam dunk in every mono black deck, and most Rakdos decks too. The inefficiency is worth being able to answer enchantments, one of the strongest permanent types in Commander, and the root of many value engines and game-winning strategies. Coming in at number four, the Expedition Party will be pleased to know that not every path is untrodden. We've got it on good authority that at least some of the routes on this Expedition map are safe, I hope. The Pathway Lands are far and away the most versatile of the new modal double-faced cards, and are fantastic fixing for Commander decks. You'll get the choice on whether to play these on one side or the other, untapped, ensuring you have the mana you need for the turn you play them. While not as flexible as a classic dual color land like a shock land or a dual land, these are a great cheap option to add to players' arsenals and are a boon to those on a budget. The cycle currently stands incomplete at six lands, but there's a promise from R&D that we will see the cycle finished quote unquote soon. Coming in at number three is Angel of Destiny. White decks have been clamoring for alternate win conditions that aren't reliant on upkeep triggers like Felidar Sovereign or Near-Death Experience, or just the generic kill a player with Aetherflux Reservoir for a while now, and Angel of Destiny delivers. Angel of Destiny is a pretty interesting take on giving white a different way to win the game. In fact, it doesn't quite do that. Instead, it makes other people lose the game. The first part of the rules text reads, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player while the angel is in play, both you and that player each gain that much life. So if you add 10 power of attacking creatures, you'd end the combat 10 life up, while the opponent's life total wouldn't be any different. They'd take the 10 damage and then gain the 10 life. That is pretty weird, but when you read the other half of the card, you'll start to understand why. At the beginning of your end step, if you have at least 15 life more than your starting life total, each player Angel of Destiny attacked this turn loses the game. It's easy to see the symmetrical life gain as an attempt to balance this card and keep it at five mana. Without that, there's no downside to trying to pull off the trigger, as you'll gain life and put the opponent closer to death either way. Whether you think it's necessary or just a shackle on White's power level, don't assume too quickly that it makes the card unplayable. Far from it. The first thing to consider is that getting to 15 life above your starting total before your end step is pretty easily achieved. Between Soul's Attendant and Soul's Sister, effects early on the curve, and the team-wide lifelink granted by cards like Lyra Dawnbringer, Odric Lunark Marshall, and True Conviction, getting that life total up without the Angel of Destiny is pretty easy. What's more, lifelink will stack with the Angel's ability, meaning you'll be gaining double the life. Many players will jump to Blade of Selves as a combo with this card, but it's not quite a combo. First off, the token copies of the Angel of Destiny will be gone before the end step, so they won't be around to trigger. Secondly, any creature that comes into play tapped and attacking hasn't actually attacked, so even if you did find a way to keep the token copies around, they still wouldn't trigger. What Blade of Selves does do, though, is give us a huge life point swing. Each angel will see each other, and the life gain will be cumulative. So if we swing with Angel of Destiny equipped with Blade of Selves, that's three double striking, two six angels in play. They'll each see the 12 total damage, and you'll gain 36 life in total. That's a lot of life. Now, there are ways to make the angel work even better. By adding red, we get access to extra combat steps. Oriella, the war leader, waves of aggression, aggravated assault, and relentless assault are just a few of the effects available to us. And they can both enable the angel to attack two players in a turn, and also gain us even more life in order to satisfy the end step trigger. By adding black, we can alleviate the issue of giving our opponent's life by opting to take it away again instead, or even deny it in the first place. Veto, Thorn of the Dusk Rose, and Sanguine Bond mean that when we gain life, it'll take away that much life from the opponents, allowing our combat damage to matter. Wound Reflection works similarly, only taking with one hand what we gave with another at the end of the turn, 
provided they survive to tell the tale. Erebos, god of the dead, can stop opponents from gaining life at all, but if you want to get really dastardly, Tainted Remedy turns that life gain into life loss. With only our Angel and Blade of Selves, each opponent is taking 4 damage and then losing 12 life, while we're gaining 36. With any other buffs, this can shred life totals quick. It's a risky card to try winning with for sure, but I really like this new tool in White's arsenal, and I can't wait to see the more degenerate applications people come up with. It's also power 2, so it can slot in Alesha builds just fine, and is tutorable and able to be reanimated by many conditional effects. Alright, coming in at number 2 is Thieving Skydiver. Hey, that's a nice turn 1 soul ring you have there. It'd be a shame if someone stole it, wouldn't it? Thieving Skydiver lets you do just that. For one in a blue, Thieving Skydiver is a 2-1 flying merfolk rogue. It's got some relevant creature types and a format staple ability. By kicking it, you gain control of target artifact with converted mana cost X or less. What's more, if that artifact is an equipment, it'll auto-equip to the Skydiver. Say hello to the new affordable Gilded Drake. Plus, it's a merfolk! A living, breathing, and actually playable merfolk. Am I dreaming? Talk about the greatest treasure of all. This is really going to end up as a staple for years to come. I almost placed it at number one. At higher level tables, this thing is probably fine, but at lower tables, it'll sure be a beating to get your ramp stolen out from under you by the Simic player who refuses to play against stacks tax, and land destruction effects. Hosing fair decks is never really fun, so try not to take the Orzhov player's chromatic lantern every game. If you played a turn one soul ring of your own, this thing can let you untap on turn three with seven mana, provided you did indeed steal a soul ring on turn two. Throw a mana crypt into the mix and your mana situation starts to look pretty diabolical. It's not limited to stealing rocks, though. Scaling with the game, you can take combo pieces like Ashnod's Altar, strong equipment like Sword of Feast and Famine, and even creatures like Worm Coil Engine. Steal Hellkite, or if you're feeling particularly mean, the Silas Wren player's commander. The control effect doesn't wear off, and with Blue's many ways to bounce creatures to hand, you're also likely to be able to reuse this creature as games go on. This card is good in the 99 of most blue decks, whether you're running a theme of cloning and stealing, or just as a value creature in other blue decks. And of course, in Merfolk decks, who isn't running those? Don't answer. So what's the number one card for Commander from Zendikar Rising to go in the 99? It's Morag, Fury of Akam. I was honestly surprised when I saw Morag, Fury of Akam previewed. A six mana, six six Minotaur warrior. Morag buffs each creature with plus one one plus zero for each time it is attacked this turn. That's not all it does though. It is one of the most outrageous landfall abilities I thought we'd never see. Extra combat steps. Before you have to change your pantaloons thinking about Morag and Sword of the Animist, just hold on a second. The limitation to this ability is that it only triggers during your main phase. It gives an additional combat, but will not grant an additional main phase after that combat phase. So you must make your land drops during a main phase to get an extra combat. It also means that while a card like Walking Atlas is great because Morag untaps it, it also doesn't untap it until the beginning of that combat. So in essence, putting a land into play with Walking Atlas will give a second combat, and provided you did this in main phase number one, you will have the opportunity to use Walking Atlas again to give an extra combat phase after main phase number two. After that, it'll go straight to your end step. There are of course some boundaries on this ability, and let's be honest, there had to be, otherwise it would have gone infinite way too easily. Besides the already mentioned Walking Atlas, the easiest ways to trigger this in red are cards like Myriad Landscape and Thawing Glaciers in main phase number one. Burnished Heart and Alpine Guide put this effect on creatures. You can also use the famous Girapur Orrery as a group hug effect to get extra land drops. The new Nahiri's Lithoforming as a scapeshift style effect. And of course, Fetch Lands, which kind of, sort of, mostly got reprinted and will continue to kind of, sort of, mostly get reprinted. Anyway, it's a good card. Obviously a top pick for commanders, I feel that if you're in this color, this is still an auto-include in the 99, one of the best cards from Zendikar Rising for Commander. But now I want to hear from you. What cards do you think are going to be the best for Commander from Zendikar Rising? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks again to sponsor of this video, Hekna. If you're looking for a 5th edition adventure set with 1980s horror theme, then be sure to check out the link in this video's description. 
tier one decks that never rotate can be purchased for, well, less than the price of those $100 booster packs, that's for sure. Tier one Popper Tron is only $53. Hey, Mardu Monarch is only $42. That's like the price of a fetch land or possibly less. Or Azov Pestilence is $31 for the complete deck. No rotation, you got it forever. $31. <laughs> That's fair. Or play with slivers for 46. Or if you are an evil person, walls combo for 45. Affinity, which I love because it actually uses affinity cards in Popper. Only $36 for the complete deck. And let's see, the most expensive deck. All right, top of the format, number one in the meta, currently Scred Fairies, 73 bucks. All right, yay, Popper.